Hello lovely people, how are you all today? I hope you're all absolutely spiffing, like I'm feeling. I'm feeling spiffing because finally I'm going to do the last of my indoor sewing. Yay! It excites me for two reasons. One, because I'm doing more sewing. But two, because I know that after this little lot, everything else I do now is going to be outside. And I just, I want to be outside all the time. So today I'm going to do my squash and cucumbers. Now in theory, they don't need to be sewn inside. You could do them either in a cold frame, on a heated greenhouse, you can sew them direct. And that's something I've done in the past. However, last year, having patiently, I'm just trying to remember how many seeds I sewed, it must have been about 40 between the different varieties of cucumbers and the different varieties of squash. Out of the 40 seeds I sewed one day, I went back the next day to just check if things needed watering. Every single little pot in the cold frame had a teeny tiny hole in the top and a missing seed. The mice had had the lot. Ugh, pesky mice. Um, I've also done some direct sewings and the foxes dug them up. Ugh, pesky foxes. So last year, thank goodness, I'd held back a few of each seed so I could sew them in pots at home, let them get established, get them down to the cold frame to harden off for a little bit and then plant them out when they're sort of big enough and sturdy enough to withstand all the critters. So I've got loads of varieties this year by accident. Actually just that thing on the fact that I'd saved a bit of seed, held a bit of seed back last year. It's, that's pretty much a sort of a truism across the board for me. I do tend to, you know, I'll do some direct sewing, I'll sew in pots in the cold frame as a sort of backup, but I almost always hold a few seeds back just in case. Based on experience in the past with foxes, slugs, and now mice. Um, and the thing about the pumpkins, which I never understand because pumpkins have so many seeds in them, but whenever you buy a packet you're lucky if you get 10 seeds and these things cost a blooming fortune they're like two pound fifty three pound a packet and last year i had a load of my own saved butternut seed fine but i was kind of trying a few new things so i'd got in a couple of um the, some of the old varieties from europe to try uh, both with the squash and the cucumbers and they cost a fortune. So thank goodness I'd saved, I, I guess out of each packet of 10, I was maybe sewing six in the cold frame, a couple of them outside direct, and I'd saved a couple. So phew, all was not lost. So today I am going to sew them all in pots. Ideally, they don't like their roots disturbing. Um, and I don't have any long pots, but this is what I had to do last year to sort of rescue the situation, and it actually worked fine. So that I I've, I sewed them in big enough pots that I didn't need to pot them on. They literally made a nice little, well, quite big plug, which I then sewed direct. So they were okay. So they don't like their roots disturbed. However, this seemed to work okay hoping it's going to work okay again this year so like I say um, so I've got an itch on my thumb on my uh, shin I had planned normally I am able to fit in about between 9 and 12 squash plants in the end of one of my beds well two-thirds of one of my beds and they scramble away and they're happy as Larry so in my head over winter I decided what I wanted to grow again this year based on the new ones I tried last year, their taste, their size, that sort of thing. I thought, great, I've got my plan. But then, rather wonderfully, I had some seeds sent to me from America, 
both from Michelle and from Shannon. Thank you both so much. Which kind of threw a curveball into my plan because I was thinking, where the heck are they going to go? I don't have any room. So, what I thought, I was kind of thinking about that three sisters method of sewing that they do in America with a corn, um, a climbing bean around it, and then underplanted with the squash. So I thought, okay, I've got three double rows of beans this year, as always. So I'm thinking where the, the poles meet there and they come down, there's about a foot or so apart underneath. Why don't I try a couple in each row underneath? So I thought, okay, that's good. That covers the three varieties that Michelle has given me. And then Shannon sent me a, I'm just going to remind myself, baby butternut. It's called climbing honey nut. They're quite tiny. Climbing is the thing that gives it away. This is a general tip if you're lacking in space. Go vertical. <laughs> There's a load of space up there. And when you come back down to the soil, how much space is it taken up? Hardly anything. So for instance, climbing beans, I grow masses of them. I grow a few bush beans, but not many. Because if you think about it, the space that say two bush beans take up, you could actually probably get three or four climbing beans. Plus, the harvest from a bush bean, let's say you get 20 pods. Well, a climbing bean is gonna give you 60 pods, if not more, if you keep picking and picking and picking. So for the space of two bush beans giving you 40 pods, you could have four, I'm doing the maths now, four climbing beans, each giving you 600, 240 pods. So um, for me, it's a no brainer because I don't have a huge space. It's only a half plot. So I've always done my vertical beans. In the past, I hadn't even thought of growing squash vertically, but what I've learned over the winter is they will go up. If you build it, they will climb. So now obviously, if you're gonna grow one of the massive kind of Cinderella types, hang on, what's the Cinderella type? The Rouge Vif des Tombes. It would, be, it would be daft to try and grow that upwards because how on earth are you going to support the humongous weight? But with these little um, baby butternuts that Shannon has sent, plus I've got a, a, about four or five seeds I saved from my honey boats, which again are quite a small one. I see no reason whatsoever not to try them up. I'm going to sort of build some A-frames. And then underneath the A-frame, I can grow one of the giants, which is the the Geet Ocasumin, I don't know how it's pronounced, which is the one that's been in all the news because was it found in a clay ball, in a clay pot, in the middle of the desert? Is it 800 years old? Has it been bred from an 800 year old squash? Maybe we'll never know the truth, but I love the romance of the tale. Anyway, so enough of the chat. Um, I've what I will do is, in terms of the amount I want to grow, I will probably sow about 50% more than I need, roughly, um, just to cover any disasters. That will give me enough seed to hold back. And then if things do, do grow well and really strongly, then I can pass my plants on to other folk. So for example, I'm just going to show you these Geet seeds which are massive. Let me just show you these a sec. Oh, sorry, I wobbled you then really badly. So they're absolutely humongous. So I've got five seeds. What I'm thinking is, I think one will take up a whole underneath of one bean row because they're going to be massive. And then another one could sit under the A-frames I'm going to build for the little climbing butternuts. That gives me three seeds left over. So I'm going to plant one more for luck. 
if all three germinate I will I've already spoken to one of my fellow plotters about the spare one she's really keen to grow it and save some seed and we've agreed that we'll all try growing it save the seed and pass it on so that you know eventually maybe over on the site can be growing these huge old geats so it's going to leave me two leftovers with those two obviously if these three don't germinate i'll put both of those in and try again if one of them fails i may just stick with two but either way i'm going to have one spare for you know if disaster with slugs or what have you and then the other one the fifth one i'm actually going to keep oh i'll probably put it either in the fridge or the freezer i'm not sure which yet but i'm gonna save one of them for next year just in case of disaster this year hideous cross pollination etc etc so five precious seeds here we go Okay, so, I mean, you probably all know this, but those of you who are growing for the first time might not. When you've got your little seed, the temptation, let me hold it that way, the temptation is probably to put it on your soil and then cover it. What you want to do is you want to sow it on its side. Does that make sense and show up? the idea is that if you sow it flat as you're watering or it's raining whatever it is if that's not draining away straight away it's going to sit on the seed and possibly rot it that's the theory i'm sure i've sown them occasionally that way when i've just chucked them in the ground and they haven't rotted but let's be on the safe side so i'm going to be sowing that way and woohoo nearly dropped it Generally speaking, you want to sow a seed to anywhere between one to two depths that the seed is. So I'm just going to poke it in with my fingers. That's only about an inch down. Give it a little firm. Next one. Oh, I'm so excited for these. These are the seeds more than any that I've been really looking forward to sowing. Not just the squads that were gifted to me. <sighs> it's like I always say that we, um, whenever we sow a seed, with that seed we're also sowing all of our hopes and dreams for the rest of the year. Please work. Yeah, so don't forget afterwards, give everything a quick watering. They'll probably, I would expect them to germinate within 7 to 10 days. They'll be little like fat-leaved plants, they'll look gorgeous. If they germinate, please germinate. Um, I'll give them a couple of weeks of growing at home. Then I'll take them down to the allotment, to the cold frame, to just begin to harden them off. Because obviously being indoors are a bit cosseted. Then when I plant them out, what I will do with all of them is cloche them with my sort of cut down big five litre water bottles. Not necessarily as protection from frost, although we can sometimes get frost in May. But it's more to stop the slugs going in, although they can still get in. It's to stop the foxes scratching at them. But also, when they're little and just planted, if, if they get too much wind and they start rocking about, before they're really established, it can weaken the base of their stem, which is actually quite a, it's actually a really weak point. And then before you know it, they snap and they're done for. As they get going, the main problem you can have with squash is mildew. So you get a white powdery effect on the leaves. So you can do a weak, uh, a sort of dilute milk water spray to help with that. But the best help you can give to prevent the mildew is actually try not to, when you're watering, try not to water the leaves. I know, of course, rain waters the leaves, but it's not quite the same as an actual bucket or a watering can of water tipped all over them. So yeah. Try to avoid the leaves, but also try to avoid the stem when you're watering. So you'll quite often see people put a bit of piping or a plant pot, maybe 10 inches away from the plant, to water into that, 
to let it go down to the roots because again that stem if it gets too wet pfft, rots snaps goes over this is such a good time of year isn't it i'm going to get on and finish potting up all of these i've got about another i think about 40 <laughs> seeds to sow but then after this little bunch that's it with the indoor sowing every time you see me in the kitchen now it'll be to cook it won't be my potting shed anymore, it'll actually be a kitchen again. And the wonderful, wonderful thing is, from now on, from this point, it's all in the garden. It's all outside, whatever the weather, with the birds singing, with the aeroplanes overhead, with the kids playing footy in the park next door. It's just so wonderful, isn't it? I'll say cheerio for now. And I'll catch up with you all again really soon. And in the meantime, happy squash planting, happy A-frame building. I can't wait. See you soon.